Hey, Life Fellowship, we're about to enter into a brand new year, and I'm going out of my mind with excitement. In fact, I've been so excited about this that I've actually pulled away with Tatum and I to go on out to almost like a cabin in the woods where we've unplugged the internet and phones so that we can do one thing, we can pray, hear from God about the direction where the Lord is leading us to in this next year. I really believe that 2024 is gonna be the greatest year of spiritual impact that our church has ever encountered. We're not only launching a second campus in Anna, but we're taking new ground in McKinney, in Dallas, and beyond for the name of Jesus. Now today, I am so excited because Pastor John Melander is bringing a, an incredible message from God for you. In fact, he shared with me what it is that he is going to be speaking on and I'm just so excited. I know that God's gonna touch your heart. He's gonna encourage you. He's gonna stir you. You're going to walk to another level with the Lord. And so I want you to open your heart and get ready to hear from God. And hey, everybody, I want you to know I love you. I'm praying for you. So let's come on, give it up a big God bless to Pastor John Melander. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Man, I am so glad to be here with you all today to, to close off this year. This has been a great year, huh? Before we get started, I just want to say, give a big shout out to Pastor Chris and Tatum. It, it's so amazing that they have the chance to get away and seek God, especially with all the kingdom work that we've been doing here at Life Fellowship. We've been building churches over in India. Uh, we have one of the largest prison ministries in the country just growing. We're taking massive amounts of land for the Lord, and it is so important that we, we pull back and we seek God, especially as we continue to grow, because we don't want to lose focus. And so I'm so proud of them. I want to let them know that we're praying for you. We love you. Uh, we're here with you. Also, I want to say hi to all the men and women that are watching online, everybody that's in the correctional facilities, that's participating in the different, in the thousands of correctional facilities all over the United States. We love you. You're part of this church family. You're not a project to us. For all my note takers out there, I want you to write in the top of your notebook, Acts 17, 11. This is one of my favorite verses. This is where Paul is praising the Jews of Berea over the Jews of Thessalonica. Because not only are the Jews of Berea focusing on Paul as he's preaching and teaching, and they're focusing on Silas, but then they're going every night after they're done hearing the preaching, they're going and they're pulling the scrolls and they're fact checking him and they're seeing what he's talking about is true. And they're coming across their own relationship, building up their own understanding with the Lord instead of thinking that they can ride on the coattails of Paul and Silas into heaven. And so that's the verse that I'm gonna challenge you with for not only today, but as we step into 2024. Read the word. Don't just believe me because I got the mic and I'm standing on stage out here. Open up your Bibles, dive in, come across your own understanding so how many of you guys are, are happy that 2023 is over? Raise hands. Yeah? It's bad for some people, good for others. Had hills and valleys both all over the place. I'm extremely excited that 2023 is over. Not because it was a bad year. It was a great year. I love 2023. Uh, but I saw what the Lord did in 2023, and I know he's gonna show out in 2024. I know it's gonna be even better. I'm excited because we get to step into Anna. Yes, we get to step into Anna, um, and we're gonna see a massive revival out there. There's not very many churches out in Anna. The, the, the workers are few out there right now. So for everybody that's gonna be stepping out there, we're gonna have a, a harvest. I'm, I'm believing that we're gonna see a massive revival this year, so it really excites me. I'm looking forward to it. So the title of this message is to leave the old behind. It's so important as we move on uh, that we shuck off the mud, the gunk, that we've carried on for the last year, for the previous years, and we don't carry that into what we have going on for this next year because God wants to use us. And if we continue to cling on to what we have in the past, then we can never step into what God has for us in the future. And so when I was thinking about this message, I thought about this couple uh, and the importance of having a short memory. And so this couple, they were... You know, heavily involved in the community, had kids, uh, dealing with the, the hustle and bustle of life, constantly running around. They started having memory problems. So they went out to the doctor's office to get checked out. Doctor said, 
Uh, it looks like everything's good to go. You don't have any issues that, that I can see, but something that might help you out is if you take a notepad and a pen and you write stuff down so that you're not forgetting. And so they said, okay, we can do that. So they went home, and the husband and wife sat down on the couch to watch some TV. I can only imagine it was Christmas time, a Hallmark Channel, you know, that story of the uh, lady that comes back from the big city, and they have the <laughs> meet, meets her ex-boyfriend at the Christmas jamboree, and they rekindle under the, <laughs> under the mistletoe, right? Yeah. <clears throat> so I can only imagine he was ecstatic when she asked for a bowl of ice cream. Said, yeah, let me hop up and get that for you, babe. So he gets up to go get the bowl of ice cream, and she, she says, hey, remember what Doc said? Doc said, we gotta write this down so we don't forget. He said, come on, I'm going and getting you a bowl of ice cream. I don't need to write that down, do I? And she says, well, while you're going in there, why don't we add one thing? Why don't you throw some whipped cream on there for me, too? And so he says, all right, I got it, ice cream, whipped cream. She says, are you sure you don't need to write it down? He says, no, babe, I think I got this. I think I'm good to go. She said, we just got some fresh cherries in there. Why don't you throw a fresh cherry on the top as well? He said, cherry on top, whipped cream, ice cream, I got it, no problem. All right, she said, are you sure you don't need to write it down? He said, nope, I'm good to go. So he disappears in the kitchen, and it's taking a little bit longer than normal to get a bowl of ice cream. And he comes walking out of the kitchen, and he's got a plate instead of a bowl. And on this plate is bacon and eggs. And so he's going to hand it to her, and she looks at him sideways, looks down at the bowl, looks at him again, looks down at the plate, and then says, I told you you should have written it down. Where's my toast? <laughs> Maybe we don't need to have that short of a memory, but we need to have a short memory when it comes to our, uh, our past. We need to be able to reflect on the wins, the growth, uh, and the important things of the past. 2,000 years ago, Paul was negotiating building the church in Philippi, and he was helping them move to the next level. And so he was instrumental in understanding their, their, the time, the place, and the culture. And they had a lot of various things that are similar to what we are dealing with today. And Paul was masterful at helping them move through. And part of the ways he did this is by helping them push through their bitterness, their guilt, their shame, their forgiveness, and then casting vision to them. So I wanna show you how in Philippians 3.13, the Apostle Paul, he encourages the believers to leave behind their past failures, achievements, and everything that holds them back. He writes, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. And when he says this, I don't claim to have taken hold of it, he means that he doesn't claim to be a perfect Christian living the, the righteous life that he's supposed to live. In fact, scripture tells us that he had a thorn in his side that he dealt with quite a bit. He's, he's saying, all have failed and fall short of the glory of God. But one thing I am doing is I'm not holding on to that. I'm not holding on to my, my faults of the past. I'm not holding on to that, that part where I was stoning uh, Stephen to death. I'm not holding on to that part where he was chasing down Christians and executing them. He's not holding on to that because he knows that God has something special for him. So he said, to forget what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward. So his life of persecuting Christians, being a legalist, and holding on to the past successes. He became, he had a, a pedigree when it came to spirituality. He had a spiritual pedigree. He was raised to be a priest. But he was living it the wrong way. He was chasing down Christians. He was very legalistic. And he's saying, I can't hold on to that. If I hold on to that, I will never be able to step into and engage with what the Lord has for me. His words still hold value today. For the church of Philippi, whom Paul was writing to, was written during a time when the early Christian church faced various challenges. The Philippian church was confronted with false teachings, uh, pressure to conform to different ways, during the first century, the Greco-Roman world was, was characterized by a diverse array of religious beliefs, philosophical beliefs. Uh, one of the things back then is the people were polytheistic, meaning that they believed in numerous gods. They had gods for every single uh, holiday, every single season, every single event in life that they dealt with. And so you can see 
where some of the morals that they were dealing with that Paul was trying to overcome in that time. And so I want to give you a couple examples of some of these gods that they were worshiping during their time that Paul had to overcome. One of them was Aphrodite. I'm sure you've all heard her name before. Aphrodite was the goddess of love and beauty. And even though she was married, she used her beauty to seduce men. In fact, they had temples that were erected for Aphrodite where they had temple prostitutes that worked in there. It was modern day brothels. Except you got a blessing when you went over to and, and were with the temple prostitutes. You can see it all through history today as well. Throughout our culture, TV, social media, seduction is something that's worshipped, right? I was doing some research on this, and I came across something that just boggled my mind. Do you know that here in the United States, 80% of Google searches are pornography-related? Do you know the second country behind us is Germany? They're at 12%. You can't tell me we don't have an issue here in the United States that the enemy isn't trying to resurrect Aphrodite over here in the United States through the internet, through TV, through all these different shows. Another god that they worship was Hades. Hades is where we get our, our word hell from. And he was the god of war and wealth. And he was said to reign in the underworld. Two of the most evil things, right? War, it deals with control, manipulation, and wealth, wealth, not, it can, wealth is not necessarily an evil thing, but what most people use it for is selfishness, is pride. It's I want this in my life. I want that bigger house. I want that faster car. I want to do this. I want to do that. And so I work harder because I want all these shiny things. People like shiny things. And so I work harder because I want these shiny things. Instead, of working harder because I want to make a bigger impact in the kingdom. I want to see more people come to Christ. I want my money to be fruitful. And in fact, that's where we've dropped the ball with the government. The church was designed to support the people, to be there for the lost, to be there for the hungry, be there for the prisoners. But the church has dropped the ball, and now government has had to step in and make all these programs to support the people. And we see how they're, they're handling that right now. One last God that they were worshiping, and they had tons of them, but I just picked out three of them for you guys. One last one was the, the God of Kronos. He was the father of Zeus and the one responsible for, and celebrated for killing his own children. They used to have a metal statue erected with Kronos with his hands out like this, and they would have a massive fire burning underneath it. And anybody who um, wanted to go sacrifice their child would go over there and they'd put them on the hands and the fire would, I'm not gonna go into too much detail, it's pretty gruesome, but, but they would sacrifice their, their children on that statue for it. If, if they were able to go to these temple prostitutes, have a child, they could have a, a child with a temple prostitute, they could go over to Kronos and sacrifice it if they had a child out of wedlock, they could go over, grab their child, sacrifice it, they would get blessed. If they had a child in wedlock and they didn't want it at the time, they could go sacrifice it and they could get blessed. It was a really jacked up culture back then, but you see where it's making a comeback today as well. These are who the population elevated and who they worshiped back at the time. And so this is what Paul had to overcome during that time. He not only had to overcome these serious moral issues but he had to show them and guide them how you're not defined by this stuff. You're not defined by your past. You may have messed up and gone to the God of Kronos and sacrificed a child, but that doesn't define you. We're gonna push forward through this. You may have shown up and, uh, and gone and met Aphrodite at the temple, but that doesn't define you. We're gonna push forward in that right now. So when Paul was preaching to the communities, he was battling this, and you see this all through his epistles. He addresses these issues. First, he employs a, a metaphor, and Paul was dynamic at using uh, literary skills in order to combat these things. And so, first, he employs metaphors, and he uses these all throughout his epistles, and the most famous one being the race. And so, in the Greco-Roman world, 
uh, races were, were well-known. Sports played a significant part of that culture, just like today. Right? Athletes were held in high esteem, placed on pedestals, almost deified. They had uh, statues that were erected of, of athletes, parades that were held, wealth was acquired with them. They were our modern-day pro football players. They were our modern-day movie stars, social media influencers. And Paul said, hey, there is a race out there that you need to get involved in that is way more important than any of these stars that you are elevating right now. In fact, he was so good at putting them there that he actually put them in the shoes of the athletes. And he said, in fact, it's not them that are running the race, it's you that's running the race. And your race is more important. You are the star quarterback on God's pro football team. You are the leading actor in his movie. You are the social media influencer that's gonna bring thousands to know Christ. He's putting you in those shoes and saying, yes, you can assimilate with these, but you are the main person. Secondly, Paul uses repetition in emphasizing his commitment. He, he says numerous times through his epistles, he says, forget the past, push forward. And when I think about this, I think about the military all the time. Military, they used to tell us, if you're told something 500 times and you do something 500 times, it becomes muscle memory. Right? They always used to do this thing where they would stomp their hand, their fist on the desk, or stomp their foot on the ground whenever something important was coming up. And so you knew whenever you're getting a block of instruction, if the instructor did this, I need to pay attention. Something important is coming up. And so they would do it over and over and over again, and they keep repeating the stuff until it became second nature in you, and, and, and you, were re you understood that that might be something vital that I need to hang on to for my military career. It might be vital for the mission that I do. And so Paul was instrumental at making sure he was using repetition. He was stomping his feet. He was saying, hey, pay attention to me. We need to leave that past behind. We need to cut the bitterness, the guilt, the shame. We need to work through unforgiveness. Otherwise, we're never going to be able to step into what the Lord has for us. Paul's call to forget what was behind and strain toward what is ahead serves as a powerful reminder. Dwelling on the, on the past, that hinders us. In fact, Michael McMillan, he had this great quote. He said, you can't start the next chapter of your life if you keep rereading the last one. Isn't that true? You keep focusing on the previous chapters of your life, you can't, you can't pull your pen out and you can't write the next chapters of it. The advice from Paul to leave the old behind applies not only to personal achievements, but also to destructive patterns that we've dealt with, harmful relationships that hold individuals back. Uh, there's three H's that I always give everybody for what they're dealing with. Uh, hurts, habits, and hangups. You need to be able to leave the hurts, the habits, and the hangups behind and push forward. So how do we leave the past in the past? Well, I'm glad you guys asked. So Paul used a, a few different things to move, maneuver through this. So I'm going to talk through these as well, the first one being letting go of bitterness. These are so impactful. They impacted my life immensely. For some of you guys who know my story, I was a drug addict. Um, alcoholic, former gang member. I was not living a good life for a while. But when I had the Lord show me these and, and, and after I had been saved, it transformed me from that relationship and took me to the next step. So I hope that this does something for you guys like it did for me back then. And so the first one is letting go of bitterness. Bitterness is defined as the result of anger, changing from an experience to a belief. Let me repeat that. It is the result of anger changing from an experience to a belief. Maybe bad relationships, right? Usually when you, when you have bitterness, you make these statements. I will never statements or I will always statements, right? I will never trust a woman with my heart again. They're all bad, right? I will always... Um, I will always uh, sit down at, at work or not do a, a full job out there because I got passed over for a promotion. Right? 
It's using those I will always statements or I will never statements. I will always seek finances. I will never go hungry again. I will never be hurt again. I'll do all those different types of things. Isaiah 38, he says, surely it was for my benefit that I suffered such anguish. In your love, you kept me from the pit of destruction. You have put all my sin behind my back. If he wouldn't have put that sin behind his back, it would have turned into bitterness because of the guilt and shame that he was holding on to. So I wanna give you guys a visual aid. Luke, will you hop up here with me, quick? I know all you guys are wondering what this present was for. So right here, we have sticks. We have sticks of guilt and we have sticks of shame. And I'm gonna ask Luke to hold on to those for me right now. What happens when we have guilt and shame is we become wounded. We, we say, how could I let that person hurt me? Why did God let that person die instead of me? Um, why couldn't I protect my loved one, right? We have, we have all these different statements that we make when we hold on to guilt and shame, and we harbor it. And what we're, do, what we're really good at when we have guilt and shame is holding everybody at bay from us. In fact, in the military, they did a, a study and it said it takes one person to tag and bag a dead body, but it takes on average 32 to render aid to a, a wounded person. And those 32 spiritually, that's your family. That's your church, that's your community, that's your workplace. When you're wounded, you hurt everybody around you. And so when you hold on to guilt and shame, you're, you're good at pushing people away, keeping them at bay, because you don't want them around you. And then when nobody's around you, you're good at taking these things and beating yourself with them. And then God shows up and says, hey Luke, I wanna give you a blessing this year. Here you go. Maybe you didn't understand, Luke. I wanna give you a blessing this year. I got something amazing for you to step into this year. Why can't Luke grab the present? He's hanging on to guilt and shame, too tight. He can't grasp on to what the Lord is trying to give him. He's gotta let go of guilt and shame. Give it to the Lord. Let the Lord throw it away. And then when the Lord comes and says, Luke, I got a present for you. I got a blessing for you. That present. Good deal. Thank you, Luke. Give him a hand real quick. So what I want to do right now is have all of you hold up your guilt and shame in your hands. Put your hands up. We've been holding on to it this past year. We've been holding on to it for maybe many of years. And what we're going to do is we're not going to step into 2024 with our guilt and shame. We're going to pass this off. So pass it all to the people to your right. And, then, and the guy at the end... Grab it and shuck it in the, the aisle way. We'll clean that junk up later. The next step I wanna talk about is forgiveness. Now if you don't hear anything else I say today, this is something that will transform your family. This is something that will impact your life. If, if you don't want anything else for today, if you're sleeping, wake up, this is the one point you need to, to really dive into, is forgiveness. And one of the, the passages that really jumped out at me and helped me, or helped explain this to me, was in Acts 10. Acts 10, Peter is, he's just finished a long trip, and he's, he's out, and he's getting ready to take a nap on this rooftop. There's this Roman centurion, and the Roman centurion is a Christ follower. He's worshiping the Lord. Jesus shows up and says, hey, if you go find Peter, he will help lead your whole family into salvation. You will see a revival in your family. And so the centurion, he walks off and he goes to find Peter. Peter at this time has only been ministering to the Jews. He has not been ministering to the Gentiles. So he's got this jaded perspective of who he's supposed to minister to, who he's supposed to talk to. And so Peter, I can only imagine, he just got done with a, a long walk. He's staying at this guy's house. He's sleeping on the rooftop, and he starts having dreams about food. Any of you guys ever have dreams about food? You gotta wake up and go rustling around through the cabinets? Yes, yes. Peter was out walking around. He was hungry, started having dreams of food. And God utilized that dream of food to teach him a lesson. So he starts, the Lord starts lowering a blanket of food to him, and on that blanket of food is all sorts of things that Jews didn't mess with. Pigs, lizards, different things like that. And Peter, 
with his infamous foot and mouth disease, he tells the Lord who's given him a blanket of food, I can't eat that, that's not clean. <laughs> and the Lord responds in Acts 10, 15, he says, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. And he had to repeat it twice to Peter. And it finally clicked. Don't call anything impure that I've made clean. So many of us, we walk around, we think that we are impure. Or the people that have hurt us are impure. They're not worthy of being saved. But God tells us, you have been made clean. They have been made clean. We have all been washed by the same blood. And you have to be able to understand that to move into forgiveness. In fact, Matthew 18 says, if we don't forgive, then he won't forgive us. So I wanna paint a picture right here for you. When you don't forgive, you might as well take Christ off the cross after he's done off the cross and they lay him on the ground. They're getting ready to wrap him up and put him in the tomb. What I want you to picture in your head is when you won't forgive yourself and you won't forgive other people, what you're doing is you're stepping over his body, walking past him and saying, I need to go put myself up here on the cross or I need to go put this person on the cross because what you did, that was great for everybody else, but it's not good enough for me. It's not good enough for them. And that's what we do every single time we harbor unforgiveness. We say, the price you paid, that was awesome. Thank you for doing that. But it, it doesn't cut it for me. In fact, we are called to have a Christ-like vision of what forgiveness looks like. And so I wanna change your perspective on what forgiveness looks like. And I want them to put up this picture of New York City. Here. You can see in this picture all these different buildings. We're standing street level. Humans, what we do is we look at sin in three dimensions. We see all these buildings and all those buildings are people in our lives. Some of the tall buildings are people that really did us wrong. Right? Their sin was quite a bit. We don't think we can ever forgive them. Smaller buildings, you know, there's people that had minor infractions in life. We might be able to move through and forgive them. Humans, we've taken and we've con contorted what forgiveness is. We've contorted what sin is, and we've started to rate it in systems and say, this is worse than this over here. And it looks like the city of New York with all the people in our lives and all the various towers but I want you to take a Christ-like perspective of what sin looks like. And Christ doesn't look at it from the ground level. He doesn't look at it from two dimensions. He looks at it from the sky. So if you look up here, you'll see the same picture of the same neighborhood, but when you take a Christ-centered view of it, you just see a bunch of squares now with the same names written down there. You don't see big towers, little towers, anything else. You see what God sees, and in Romans 3.23 it says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, right? That's each and every single one of us. So when you can take that Christ-centered perspective, you can start to move forward through forgiveness, understanding that it's not, um, it, it's not a, he doesn't want us to take it and make it 3Ds, right? It's a two-dimensional issue. The third step to embrace is a forward-focused perspective. In the third century, there was this guy named Maxinus. Now, Maxinus, he was a, a Roman emperor. He was extremely evil. They, they said he used to um, summon demons when he would torture people. He was, he was ruthless. Constantine found out about all this stuff and heard the cries of the people, and he went out and rallied an army to go overthrow Maxinus. And when they were on their way to Rome to overthrow Maxinus, in the sky appeared this massive cross. And in the middle of the cross read, in hoc vents, which means, in this, overcome. And he was confused, because he was not a Christ follower at the time. None of his guys were Christ followers at the time. He didn't know what it meant. But everybody come running up and said, hey, did you see that? Yeah, I saw that. That's crazy, I don't know what it means though. And so he laid down that night and he started meditating on it and started thinking about it. What in the world did that mean? In hoc vents, in this overcome. And Jesus shows up to him in a vision and says, if you will carry this, you will have victory in all you do in life. 
And so at that moment, without somebody going to him and leading him in a salvation prayer, he gives his life to the Lord. And he says, I will carry that cross. I will go into battle with that. And he goes on to defeat Maxinus in battle and becomes the very first Christian emperor in history. Not only that, he establishes the city of Constantinople as the first Christian capital of the world. And so he had vision. He was able to set aside his past, see what the Lord was doing, and push on towards what the Lord had for him. And he was very successful in what he did because he had faith and he trusted in what the Lord was doing. Additionally, part of being forward focused is being healthy. If you're gonna run a race, you're not just running the race, right? There's a lot of prep work that's involved in running the race. You have to eat healthy. You have to get plenty of rest. You have to be mentally prepared for what you're gonna do in battle or how you're gonna run, right? And so for us, spiritually, we need to read, pray, worship. That, that's what we have to do to be ready to, to step into 2024. In fact, did you guys know that there is a doctor's prescription that God gives us? He, in Proverbs 4, he gives us a doctor's prescription. All throughout, there's 12 times before he gets to Proverbs 20. 12 times he says, listen to me. Pay attention. Heed my words. Gain understanding. And then he gets to verse 20 through 22, and he says, turn your ear to my word. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to one's whole body. The word health and healing in the Hebrew, which they use, is the word marpe. And marpe means that it is a, it's medicine, it's a cure, it's deliverance. Right? He just gave you a doctor's prescription. If you will meditate on my word, if you will read it, if you will worship, if you will lean into it, you will be healed. You will experience healing. You will be set up to step in and walk out that vision. There's a story of a guy <clears throat> that I wanna show you out here who is extremely um, held back by his unforgiveness, by his sin, shame, guilt. Here he is, this is a picture of me about 10 years ago. If some of you guys haven't heard, some, haven't heard my story before. So not only was I in the military for 10 years, but then I got out and uh, was riding with one of the world's largest 1% motorcycle clubs. I was uh, jacked up on meth the majority of the time. You can see I got a beer in my hand right there. I was alcoholic nonstop. When I met my beautiful wife, I told her, I said, there's two things I'll never do. I said, I'll never step foot in a church and I'll never marry you. I said, if you're fine with that, we'll continue this relationship. And the Lord showed up when I got invited to a veterans event and I went out there and was sitting around and they were all Christ followers. And I had never seen this before in my life. And they started praying over me, putting hands on me, anoint me with oil. And the, it was, the Holy Spirit showed up and it was like he punched me in the chest. I lost all my oxygen. I started bawling, I hadn't cried in years. And I started bawling and I said, what is going on here? And I had a road to Damascus moment with the Lord. And when I arose out of that, I said, Lord, I'm all yours. I cast away everything else that I was doing. I was immediately done with the drugs. I was immediately done with the alcohol, the smoking. I hadn't, I, I cast all of it off. I immediately cast away that unforgiveness, that, that trauma that I had harbored from being in the military, all the bad stuff that I had done in my life, I cast it off and I said, Lord, I just wanna be used. Just use me. And the Lord said, you're gonna step into the prisons. I said, okay, I'll step into the prisons. And me not knowing how to hear from the Lord, I, I, I immediately think, if I'm stepping into the prisons, Lord, give me a church service. Where's all the hundreds of men that I'm supposed to be ministering to here in the, in the prison? No, you don't get that. There's one guy who's 62 years old who's never learned how to read. You can step in and teach him how to read. And so I went out and bought this book, Teach Your Child How to Read, 
in one year. And we started working through that book three times a week. And we started going through it. And after about three months, he said, John, why do you do this for me? And I said, Jesus, man. I said, he's completely transformed my life. He's called me to step in here to the prison and just show love. I don't know how it looks like, but you get to be the lucky first guy. <laughs> and he said, I'm curious about that. You think we could start doing our reading lessons out of the Bible? I said, definitely. And I went out and bought him a Bible, and we started doing our reading lessons out of the Bible. A couple weeks later, he says, I got a bunch of buddies down at the pod that are curious about what we're talking about. Will you come down there and do a Bible study with us? Yeah, I'd love to. So I went down there, and it was a little 10-foot by 12-foot brick room that we'd go into, and it was just two, three, four of us for a couple weeks. All of a sudden, I walk in there one morning, and there's 40 guys standing in that little room. And the programs manager comes down and says, you got to turn this into a church service. This is way too big. And not only that, but we got this guy from Life Fellowship Church. His name is Pastor Stefan Klusman. I said, you got to go out and meet this guy. He's starting up a prison ministry right now for Life Fellowship. And so me and Stefan linked up, linked arms at that time, and then we, we decided to start pushing forward with prison ministry, and you guys know the rest. Now we're in thousands of facilities. We have over 150,000 inmates that watch every single week. But it wasn't me, right? It was God preparing and using. With me being able to shuck off the past, and just saying, Lord, I will be used in any way you want me to be used. If it's for one guy to teach him how to read, well, that's what I'm going to do, Lord. I'm going to step in and I'm going to teach that one guy how to read. And if you want to open more doors to do more things, I will believe that you will open doors. And I will just be faithful and I will keep stepping through them. And so this year, I want us to, to step in to 2024. And I want to challenge you guys. I know some of you guys know that I liked movies like Gladiator and 300, of manly movies, right? Big tough dudes. I love Leonidas in, in 300, when the enemy is trying to negotiate with them, they show up and the enemy says, if you fight us, our arrows are gonna blot out the sun. And Leonidas, he smiles at him and he says, I guess we're fighting in the shade. <laughs> this year, when the enemy shows up and says, our arrows are going to blot out the sun. You're not going to see the light of day out here. You just smile and say, I'm not afraid to fight in the shade. And in fact, I'm bringing the light of Christ with me. So let's kick 2024 in the teeth and let's show up and let's... Let's dive into this 21 days of prayer and fasting that we're kicking off with tomorrow. Let's give the Lord our first. Let's pursue him like we've never pursued him before. But let's not step into 2024 holding on to that guilt, that shame, that unforgiveness. Let's cast that stuff aside. Say, Lord, I cannot step into what you have for me if I'm gonna hang on to this stuff. So if you would, bow your heads, let me pray for you. Lord, I just want to thank you for the immense growth this past year, the revelations you have given to each and every single one of us. Lord, I pray that we may step into this next year, not holding on to the ways of the world, that we may be able to forgive and let go of guilt and shame, so that we may be vessels for your word that are strong, rooted, and guided by you. Lord, I pray blessings over every person under the sound of my voice right now, that relationships would be restored, that your love would be felt to all corners of the earth. In Jesus' mighty name. Some of you may be away from Christ, and one of your, your first step of this year needs to be inviting Christ back into your life. And so if that's you, I just wanna ask you, I wanna say a prayer over you, just repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I come before you, acknowledging my need for salvation. I recognize that I have fallen short and have sinned. I'm in need of your forgiveness and grace. I believe in your son, Jesus Christ, and I accept him as my Lord and Savior. I believe that he died on the cross for my sins and rose again. I repent of my sins. Come into my heart, Jesus. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. Let's celebrate all those that just went from death to life.